Uh, today, what we are dealing with is the blood in Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus shed blood in seven different areas, not just one area, but in seven different areas. On Sunday morning, we learn that uh, we learn that the, the, the priests will take two goats. One will go on the inside. They will sacrifice that goat, and the priest will dip his finger in the blood of the goat and sprinkle seven times. We also learn that when a demon spirit comes out of a person, they go out and they look, they look for seven other spirits, wicked, much more wicked than them, and they come back in, not trying to get all to, to, to get in, but to see which door might be open so that the one that have access to that door will get in and then invite the rest in. Amen? You get a picture? All right. So we are, we are going to learn how to close those doors. We are fasting, and we are asking you to go from midnight to 6 p.m. without any food, just drinking water and a lot of teas. And then at 6 p.m., you can eat any cooked food except meats. No red meat, no poultry, no sweets, but you could have fish. All right? And you can eat as much as you want. Uh, up to up to midnight uh, if you are on medication of course we are asking you to please eat I don't want you all to go telling your doctor the pastor said that we don't don't eat no you're going to eat but you're not going to eat any meats and any sweets at all which is very good for you and if you're worried about the proteins have a lot of beans when you have a lot of beans don't come to church amen because <laughs> we know what you do when you eat beans but but you can also get it with fish all right Okay, so those, those uh, handout, the, the, the fasting handout is, we have it available to the back too as well. So if you don't have it and if you're here for the very first time, we welcome you. If you're here for the first time, would you lift your hands if you're here for the first time? First time right here. Where are you from? I'm Georgia's co Georgia's co-worker. Oh, okay, you, are you an environmentalist too? You don't do environmental? I'm on the accounting. The accounting part, amen. You are more smart. You deal with the money. All right, we study hard in the environmental engineering and science department, and you get the money, you handle the money. <laughs> All right, so good to have you. And what is your name? Melissa. Melissa, come on, welcome, Melissa. <laughs> Amen. Is that your mom, uh, Esther? I, I don't think, is this the first time or she was here before? Melissa, Esther. Esther Garden. Well, we welcome Esther's mom. What is your name, mom? Jeanette. Jeanette. Welcome, Jeanette. Amen. Anybody else? <laughs> Who is that? Oh, we were praying for Aiden. That's, that's your son. Tonight we get to anoint him with oil. All right. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So good to have my good friend Maurice Baum. If you have your oil over here, uh, please uh, get your oil because I want you to keep the oil in your hand. All right. And then we are going to. That's okay. You could come up while I'm teaching. All right. All right. So we are going to deal with the first area that Jesus shed blood. We learn on Sunday morning that there are three components or parts of the blood. Anybody remember them? What is a red blood cell called in, in biology? The red blood cell is called what? The erythrocyte. The white blood cell? Leukocyte. And then you have the? No, no, no. no. I don't want the doctors talking. I, I want you. And then the, the platelets. All right. And the liquid that all three of these component, components travel in is called what? The liquid is what? The plasma. Come on, give yourself a round of applause. All right. Amen. That's very good. <laughs> All right. So we're going to deal with the first place Jesus shed his blood, which was in Gethsemane. All right. Now, we are going to, and I know that uh, Angela is here. She's a nurse, and we have a couple of doctors here. We have, uh, you know, uh, advanced we have advanced nurses that exclude, you know, you know, you know, you have to become a doctor just for me. All right. I'll come to that graduation. All right. And we have a science te teacher working on PhD in, in leadership. All right. I got it straight. See, I got it straight. Amen. So, so we're going to help me with some of those words. All right. But the bleeding on the face is where, in the, fa in the face of Christ and in the head of Christ, is where it took place first. And in medical science, you call it the hematidrosis. Hematidrosis. All right. And that is a real medical term, and there are children today that are suffering from that, and we're going to find out how this particular medical thing happens to an individual. It is real. All right. See, it's always good to have a pastor that, that have a science background. All right. Amen. Not economics and political science. I'm talking about science. All right. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here a while I, go, while I go over there and pray. 
And he took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Because, you see, he was a man of vision. He knows what's going to come next. So he saw in the vision that he's going to be crucified. He got instruction before he came to the earth that you're going to come on the earth and you're going to die like a lamb. So now he gets this instruction. He sees his vision. It's coming very close now, all right? In verse 38, he says, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the deepest, most terrible form of depression. So did Jesus had to suffer depression? Yes. Did, did, did Jesus suffer fear? Yes. Did he suffer anxiety? Yes. And I'll show you the scripture later on, all right? But he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Verse 39 says, going a little further, he fell, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Falling to his face may not necessarily be that he volunteered falling to his face. It can be because of the intensity of his depression. His knees became so weak that he fell to his, to his face. Are you with me so far? All right. A lot of times, we don't kneel and pray until there is some situation in our life. You all know what I'm talking about now, right? As long as things are going well, we prefer to stand up and pray. But when things get really tough, then we really get down on our knees and we begin to pray. In this particular case, the depression and the pressure and the stress that was on Jesus caused his knees to become so weak. Now, you have to understand who Jesus Christ is. You have to understand he was identified as the son of man and he was also identified as the son of God. As the son of man, he's totally man. As the son of God, he's connected with God. Amen? So he's dealing with this situation here as a man and he's also dealing with it as the son of God. But he's dealing with it as a man. He's the man of all men. He says here now, as a man now, because he said the son of God won't make the statement. A man will make the statement when he's under pressure. A son of God does not make the statement. A son of man will make the statement. Going further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, this is not the son of God speaking. This is now the son of man speaking. Are you understand what I'm saying? Why, why is he doing this? Because you and I are just like him. We are man and we are also sons of God. But as many as receive him, to him he has given power to become sons of God. So you are sons of God at the same time you are son of man. You are man too as well. So he said, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He is now bargaining with God. He is now functioning as a man. Otherwise you would say, well he's God in the flesh, you know. Of course, that's God. He can do that. Then, it, then his story is not related to us. Then his story will not help us. His history will not help us. His experiences will not help us. So he had to be man. So that now his experience, we can identify with his experience, and so we can help ourselves. All right? If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not, my, not, not as I will, but as you will. So he comes back in as the son of man. He, he cries out to take the cup. But then the Son of God kicks in. I said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He tells you that one hour is really the minimum, all right? So if you're doing 45 minutes a day, you may not be able to touch God the way that you need to touch God, all right? And he asked Peter, he asked Peter, watch and, and, and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right. Verse 42 says, he went away a second time and he prayed. The first time he prayed, he was bargaining with God. He said, if it's possible, take this, this cup away from me. Nevertheless, your will, not my will. Now, he went, again, went away again a second time and he prayed the same prayer. My father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, Unless I drink it, may your will be done. Wow. That tells you the pressure that Jesus was in. Some of you all are going through pressure, but I could guarantee it's not that amount of pressure. Verse 43 says, and when he came back, 
he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more again. This is the third time. And he prayed for the third time now, saying the very same thing, bargaining with God up to three times, if it is possible to take this cup away from him. And then he concluded, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. So in other words, during your time of stress, during your times of adversity, it is okay to make that bargain. Why? Because he did. Eventually, that bargain will lead you to the other one. Not your will, but his will. It is okay to be under pressure. It is okay to feel like you're losing. Because that's what was happening to him. He would have never asked for that cup to be taken away if he didn't feel that he was losing. So there was a great battle and a struggle on the will within the soul of Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth. It's a great battle. There was a big struggle that was taking place. He prayed three times to get out of the struggle, but asked to stay in the will of his father every time. So during your time of adversity, during your time of stress, you're going to feel like giving up. But if you can just hold on long enough, your language will begin to change. You see, this struggle and this battle was so intense with fear. Yes, Jesus was facing fear. Now, I want to tell you this here, and I want you to pay, please take note of this. When a demonic spirit of fear comes around you, you feel exactly what is that spirit. If that spirit is a spirit of fear, you will feel fear. But that's not you. You're feeling the spirit. If I bring fire near you, what would you feel? Ice cold? No, you will feel heat. Now, you are not the heat. The heat and you are separated. But you can discern it and you can feel it. But you are not conquered by it. You just feel it. So even though fear comes around and you feel fear around you, you are not conquered by it. The spirit is just around. Now, all, you know, now bear in mind, all those demons now was coming into that garden. They are all now surrounding that garden. They are in that garden. Fear is in there. Anxiety, depression, mental stress. Everything was there. And so Jesus was under this intense stress level that his body, his physical body, was now feeling it, it was reacting to it, and it needs now to get rid of the stress. Your body gets rid of stress in a very funny way. When your stress is very high sometimes, your body begins to feel low. We call that depression. Depression, however, is the body's way of curing you from the stress. Oh, Jesus. Now, Pastor, how do you know this? I've been through all this stuff. Especially last year, I lost 12 people. How do you mourn for 12 people? You think your pastor was having a good time. I came up here smiling with everybody, but I was dying on the inside. I had to deal with stuff. No, no, I want to let you know I'm doing good now, right? Don't worry about me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the body needed a particular way to release this level of stress or toxicity. It needed a way, and the only thing that can actually help this level of stress is blood mingled in sweat. Sometimes when you're under stress, your eyes become red. Sometimes your face becomes dark. Why? Because your body is now being deprived of oxygen going to your head area, and so your body, your face will become either red or, or darker. These are all different ways that the body begins to struggle to actually ease itself from, from its pain. But all those things really, even though it may look bad, is really a good thing because it's really getting rid of something that is bad. All right. Now, Jesus won the battle, that was lost in the first garden. Because in the first garden, when the devil came to Adam, he gave up his will. Sorry, he, he, gave, up his, he gave up his will to take the will of the enemy. And when he took up the will of the enemy, he actually intensified his own will. Are you with me so far? So in the first garden, man lost the battle and he gave his will over to Satan. In the second garden... Jesus won the will and took it back for us. Amen. Now, you have to understand here, 
Jesus is not on the scene to do things for himself. He's not even thinking about himself. His assignment was not on for himself. His assignment was for other people. In fact, every leader, their assignment is never for themselves. Dr. Martin Luther King's assignment was not for himself. He lost his life. Abraham Lincoln, leaders never really come to do battle for themselves. They always come to do battle for someone else. So Jesus is going through this terrible battle and he's thinking about you and I. Now he could have said, man, I'm the son of God. Yeah, man, I could just flick my finger and just get out of this stuff. Of... But he's looking at you. He's looking at your future. He's there in the garden 2,000 years ago and he's thinking about the year 2015 and the people that are in 2015. Now watch this carefully. So he won the battle in the garden and I want you to please listen to this and listen to this very slowly. Amen? And I have to say it very carefully too as well. He won the battle as a first fruit offering in the Garden of Gethsemane. He could not win the battle as any kind of offering. He had to be the first fruit offering. Why? Because the law of first fruit states that whatsoever happens to the genetics of the first fruits happens equally to the genetics of the second and the lineage. So that's why he has to come as a first fruit. He couldn't come as a second fruit or a third fruit. He had to come as a first fruit. Your forefathers to the fourth generation is your first fruit. So when you want to take care of your situation and what's happened to you, you have to go back to the, your father, your father, father, and father, father. So you have to go back to your father, your grandfather, great-grandfather, and your great-great-grandfather to solve this issue. The problem, though, is that none of us knows our great-great-grandfather. I barely even know my grandfather. Well, in fact, I don't, I have never met my grandfather. Both of my grandfathers who died before I was born. Much more for my grandfather, oh my Lord, much more for my great-great-grandfather. So Jesus made some provision for this. You have to understand the laws, and God sticks by his law, so he needed a first fruit offering in order to destroy this particular sickness. First fruits have the power to break generational defective genes. I'm being careful how I use the words, amen? First fruits has the power, it has the chemistry and the engineering, in genetic engineering, to break generational defective genes and restore it back to its original and its initial formula. All these stuff happens naturally in, chemi in chemical laboratories. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, He is also head of the body. It's telling you how he is the first fruit. He's first of everything to happen. Okay, think about, think about this carefully. How can Jesus be the first resurrection if he rose Lazarus from the dead? If he raised Lazarus from the dead, then how can Jesus still be the first resurrection? And the Bible says he is the first resurrection. Well, when, Laz when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he rose before him. But Lazarus died either from old age or some sickness or some disease. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he never died again. So he was the first resurrection. And that qualified him to be the first fruit and not Lazarus. If Lazarus was the first fruit, then you and I, who died in Lazarus, will have to raise from the dead and die again. But if Jesus becomes the first fruit, the law state that whatsoever happens to the first fruit must happen to everybody that is within the lineage of that first fruit. That's the law. So we are not under Lazarus, we are under Jesus. So now, since Jesus died and rose from the dead, what happens to the first fruit must happen to you and I, so you and I have to raise from the dead too. And we have to change a resurrected body. In Isaiah chapter, in Colossians says, he's also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning for the firstborn from, uh, from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He is involved in everything, because he's the first root. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 6 says, all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. Watch, watch this. This is happening now in the garden, right? Each of us has turned away from his own words to his own ways, but the Lord has caused the iniquity 
of us all to fall on him. So imagine he's in the Garden of Eden and the entire world's present, past, and future, the iniquities has now fallen on him. That means iniquity is really the sins of all your forefathers has fallen on him. No wonder this man was in such intense pain. I think what he went through in the Garden of Gethsemane was worse than being nailed on the cross. And the enemy was really after his mind. He, if, if he could have gotten Jesus' mind, if he could have taken Jesus' mind and make Jesus' mind his mind, then that's it. This would be the second time he conquered the will of man. Depression and anxiety is really when your will is out of control. It's when you don't have control over your will. So you feel disoriented. You feel, uh, you know, you feel, uh, what, what, what would you say? Uh, so pressed down. You feel like you have no say over what you want to say. That's what depression feels like. Hopeless is the, is the right word. You feel so hopeless. And now he came to fight for that back. Because from time to time, we all do feel so. There's some situation in our lives, if we've been through a divorce, a separation, a separation of relationship, family member died, whatever it might be, relocation, whatever, it, we feel that from time to time. But all that iniquity came upon him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead, this is the first root now, and has become the first fruit to those who has fallen asleep. So now, he is risen from the dead. There are some people that died before he rose from the dead. He has now become the first fruit to all of them. That's why some of them got up, the Bible says, some of them got up the grave. He had to send back some of them. Some of them went and they said hello, you know, to their aunt and their, aunt and their uncles. The Bible recorded that stuff. Hmm. He became the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So we see now that he's setting the order. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, that's the first Adam, even so in Christ also shall be made alive. How, how is that going to happen? By resurrecting them. But each one in his own order, because there's going to be some dead and some alive when he comes back. Let me say that again. There are going to be some dead when he comes back, and there's going to be some still alive. So he made provision for both of them. You that are dead, I am the first fruit, you will raise again. You that is alive, I will transform your body. That means I have to really take you into death, bring you back in, so I'm going to rapture you. Well, that's what they call it out there, you know. In the kingdom circle, you can't use that word too much, you know. But I'm going to use it, because that's what's going to happen. We may not call it that over there, but your body is going to change, and you're going to be caught up with him. Are you with me so far? In fact, in fact, let's read that. Let's read that. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are in Christ at his coming. So at his coming, there's some of them that are going to still be on the planet, so he has to change them and rapture them up. All right. Luke chapter 22 and verse 44 says, And being now in anguish, wow, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This particular thing is a medical condition. It is called a hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is a rare but very real medical condition where one sweat will contain blood. How does this happen? The sweat glands are surrounded by tiny blood vessels. And these vessels, they will constrict or they will dilate. They will constrict, they become small or become large until it gets so large that these veins rupture, and when it ruptures up, it goes into the glands where the water is, and then comes out of the skin. But it takes very high, intense, or extreme anguish for this thing to begin to happen. This that we call the hematidrosis. For hematidrosis to take place, you have to be in intense agony, intense anguish. You have to have, in other words, the uh, the iniquity of the world upon you to do that. The entire world sin. This condition is induced by stress and by anxiety. You, you see the words I'm using there? Stress and anxiety. In other words, for Jesus to experience 
this breaking of the cells in his face and in his head, he had to be attacked or be feeling stressed out and very anxious. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. He's going through all this stuff. You, you're going through it. Some of you are going through it right now. He's been through that already. He's still in the garden. While he's in the garden, he's going through anxiety. He's going through stress. Wow. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. You know why he understands our weaknesses? For he faced all of the same testing that you are going through right now. Hallelujah. Jesus faced lust. Jesus had to face adultery. Jesus, you know, Mary was no ordinary looking lady. She was called Mary Magdalene. Magdalene was not her last name. Magdalene was the name of the village. But she was the beauty of the village. So they named her after the village. Even the high priest them slept with her too. Oh, you think the high priest them, those boys, why do you think they want to get rid of Jesus? They had so much power, they, they were the bishop of that time. So they, they choose their girls. Amen. And we got bishops. To, all right. Okay. Anyway. Yet. <laughs> yet. He did not sin. So is it possible to feel anxiety and yet not sin? Is it possible to feel depressed and yet not sin? The man was feeling all the stuff and the Bible says, yet he did not sin. Whatever you're feeling, you're not sinning. You're just feeling some stuff. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. All right. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood, which is hematidrosis, falling down to the ground. Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, all right? The atonement is the sacrifice Jesus Christ made to help overcome sin, adversity, and death. That's what atonement means. And what he was doing, he was like a little animal, a little lamb, that was taken through this garden and the process in seven different areas, all because he's trying to produce a blood that will bring atonement. But you cannot shed the blood one time. Because in the Old Testament, making atoning blood had to be shed seven times because the priest sprinkled seven times. So Jesus now, he could have just gotten one blood shedding, but instead of one blood shedding, he had to have seven sets of blood shedding. That's what makes it worse. To, uh, next week, we are going to be dealing with uh, 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 iniquity. That is the sins of your forefathers. And see where he shed blood. Where he shed blood over there was internally. It was not externally. He was bleeding on the inside because there's some stuff that you're dealing with on the inside, even though you look nice on the outside, but you're dying on the inside. And Jesus died to shed blood to take care of what is in the inside. <laughs> Amen. Now, blood usually oozes from the forehead, the nail, the umbilicus, which is your navel, really, and the skin surfaces. It, it comes out from those different areas when you are under this type of anguish. So, so the Bible is recording now that this particular, in this particular time, Jesus was bleeding on his face and his head. In other words, to protect his own mind from the enemy, he had to shed his own blood to cover his mind. <laughs> so his blood actually covered him. It did not only cover his face, it covered his entire head. Because you would bleed, in this process, you would bleed through your eyes, you would bleed, you would bleed through your nose, Nosebleed is actually one of those indications of high intensity. Amen. So he was, he, he, but he conquered it all so that every one of us can actually do it. Now, I want to go quickly because whoa, we're running out of time. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he sees. Now, it depends if you're nice or if you're ugly. I mean, if you're really ugly, you might want to forget what you saw. But, <laughs> but, but in this case, he's saying something different. But whosoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed and they will be, do, be able to do great things. Now, watch, what is it saying? The Word of God tells you about you. It tells you who you really are. It's one thing to read that I am more than a conqueror and then turn away from the mirror of the word of God and say that I'm a loser. Amen. 
When you look into the mirror of his word, you will see freely without bondage who you are. You are more than a conqueror. You are made in the image and the likeness of God. You see, you will see yourself healed when you look at the mirror. The mirror says, by his stripes, I am healed. Healing is the children's bread. But when you look at the medical report, another mirror, you say, oh my Lord, let's make preparation. In Trinidad and Tobago, coffee and tea. Uh, coffee and biscuit. Biscuit and coffee. That's when you die. They do the week. Amen. So you see yourself healed without sickness, full of joy, not of sorrow. A winner and not a loser. Amen. The word of God does not condemn you. Even when you get conviction. If you are reading something from the Bible and you're feeling condemned, that is not God's voice. The word of God does not condemn you. What does the word of God do? It convicts you. Convicts mean it tells you or it alerts you that you need to reconnect and make some changes. You have to repent. Change the way that you're thinking. Hmm. What does it do? It convicts you. It confirms you. And it affirms you. So the next time the devil whispers guilt into your ears, don't plead guilty. Plead the blood. Amen. Amen. Because blood does not condemn you with guilt. It saves you from guilt. Yeah. Now we're going to piggyback a little bit from, from Sunday, right? When the devil whispers in your ears that you cannot change, you are not strong enough. He says you are not strong enough. You don't have enough willpower to overcome this cup that is now between, before you. So you need to make the compromise. Give up your will and take this other will instead. Tell him no problem. But just tell him, not my will. Because he's after your will. But his will be done. Yeah. The way that God has designed us, it is much easier for us. In fact, you, you see that lady for us to believe somebody else other than ourselves. So in that case, we, why, why we just don't believe God instead? If we have a habit of believing somebody else, what they say about us, because when they come in and tell you that you're ugly, and you're stupid and you're not going to be anything else, you believe that stuff and you get depressed. So you might as well just ask, see what God has to say, somebody else has to say, and then believe what he says, since you're kind of designed that way. Then plead the blood and start thinking about what God said about your particular situation. Now watch this carefully. Millions of dollars, millions of dollars are being spent by governments all over this world in an attempt to help people to actually recover their own will. So they designed a catchword that says, just say no. And they said to drug addicts and alcoholics and people are going through all kinds of stuff, just say no. And it seemed to be working for a little while, but the same people who are just saying no are turning right back and going right back into the drugs, going right back into the alcohol. Because you see, they were fighting with their own strength. Just say no is based on your strength, on their own strength. But it is not our will, but someone else's will that will win for us. That is the will of God. Just say no is not working. You have to say what God says. Amen? When we yield to the will of the enemy, we are yielding to someone else's will. So why not just yield to the will of God, who is someone else, with good thoughts that is thinking, making plans just for us. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Our will gets empowered from God's will. To activate God's will in our lives, we must first plead the blood. In other words, before quoting any scripture, you got to first plead the blood. You know why? Because sometimes you don't know what to say. And we just found out yesterday, uh, sorry, on Sunday, that blood does speak. Abel's blood speak, Jesus' blood speak, and we are finding out now in the medical laboratory, hematologists now are proving that when you take laser light and you, and you confront that beam against a cell of the blood, the blood actually resonates a sound. Well, God is light, and he's more than a laser light, and wherever light shows up, if there is blood, the blood is going to speak. This light of God is so strong that it does not only answers to Jesus' blood. It even answers to Abel's blood. So I wonder when God comes over you and his light beams into your blood, I wonder which one of the blood is he responding back to. 
I wonder if he sees only your blood or does he see the blood of Jesus? So right now I want you to say, I plead the blood of Jesus over me. Because he's everywhere. Amen. Amen. All right. We're coming to a close, all right? Iniquity is really another word for genetic alteration or genetic mutation. Okay, we have an issue that we are dealing with right now. We just got a law passed. We have to be very careful right now in Texas. They are, they are filing, the, the lawyers are filing, and I think the governor already signed a, a, a bill into act, and, and that is to prevent pastors from being sued for not participating in gay same-sex marriage. All right? So we want that same thing in Florida, but at the same time, we want God to do something in the Supreme Court and bring somebody to get majority vote, whatever he wants to choose to do. All right? Maybe my put Genesis there. All right. Iniquity is really another word for genetic mutation or genetic alteration. Now, please listen to me carefully, and I quote, and I will be very careful how I say what I say, all right? I'll be very careful what I say. Scientists are actually saying, from their research, many years of research, that there is no such thing as a homosexual gene. What they're saying is that there is an alteration due to environment from a study of epigenetics that the environment actually provokes another thing called a methyl group, and the methyl group comes to the double helix, which is in the, the DNA, of the, the nucleus of the DNA, and it twists and turns it to a slight angle, causing a dysfunction in the human. Yeah. Now, that's their words, dysfunction. Amen? Yeah, amen. Am I doing good there, Lloyd? Okay, I'm all right. I am quoting. Now, I am a scientist too as well, and I did do some studies in genetics, but I'm not quoting from my research. I am quoting from their research. So iniquity really is another word for genetic mutation. Genetic mutation or alteration takes place when three to four generations of, of fathers create personality and characteristics that conforms or changes into the forms of nutrients. These nutrients finds its way into a compartment of the cell that is called the Golgi apparatus. It is stored in the Golgi apparatus three to four generations of personalities and characteristics. It remains in the Golgi apparatus. You go about your business, you are a born again, spirit filled believer in the Lord, and then suddenly you start feeling different types of uh, sinful nature. Start emerging within yourself. And he said, but all the time I was doing well. Why is it suddenly I feel like drinking alcohol? Why is it suddenly I don't feel an attraction to the opposite sex? And there is something that is actually happening and taking place because there are some proteins that were stored into the Golgi apparatus that now came alive and is now transmitted through your body six seconds every time throughout your body. And what it's doing now is creating certain types of feelings and you're confused by what you're feeling. And all that's happening is an iniquity or what we call a genetic alteration of gen genetic mutation. Iniquity is the sins of your forefathers that is trapped within your cells. You got your puppies and your great grandpappy genetics and genes inside of you. You got it. I know a man that is now half bald, but his father had a full head of hair. And his grandfather had a full head of hair, but his great-grandfather was completely bald. Sometimes it skipped some generation. Why? Because those two generations did not get in the same environment that provoked that gene to become mutated. That's why God keeps stressing all the time that we ought to be in the environment and in the presence of God. When you are in the environment or the Eden, the environment of God, the Eden, you will never malfunction. Amen. Adam began to age when he came out of the environment or the Eden of God. He began to malfunction. No, I can't say that. All right. Iniquity is really like a genie inside of your gene. You have your gene, but you have another voice speaking out of your gene. And that is your grandfather's voice. 
That is your great grandfather's voice that is speaking out of your gene. There's a genie in your gene. It is an illegal sound in our gene transferred to us by our fathers. We go about ourselves, we want to live a good life, and suddenly we go into an environment where other friends went into, we begin to take the drugs, but our friend never did. We went in the same environment that our fathers was. But maybe the other two that was there with you were not from the environment or did not inherit genes that came from their fathers. That is what you call, this is what you call iniquity. Amen. But God's will was designed to actually silence and destroy the genie's voice and replace it with his voice and sound or his will to become your will. Now, you hear, you hear the word I'm saying now? I'm saying God's voice was designed to change the gene in you. But we need a sound to do this. And in order to have a sound to do this, God has actually placed sound in blood. That's why Jesus' blood is so powerful. Amen. Remember again, God heard the sound or the cry from Abel's blood. Then the, and he responded to that, to that cry. But the Bible says... If Abel's blood can cry out this much, how much more would the blood of Jesus cry out on your behalf? So now, since iniquity or a genetic alteration or genetic mutation is found in where? In blood. It's not found in flesh. It is found in blood. All right? Then we need a transfusion of pure, unaffected father's blood, another father's blood, to come back into our veins. How do you call the thing again when, when you go through the, for, for, for sugar that you remove the blood? Dialysis. We need a dialysis with blood, but blood from the Father. Hmm. I'm going to close with this. And since blood has a sound that we may call a genie, then the genie of all genies, Jesus Christ, his blood makes a new sound in the nucleus of the human cell or our being and our will is satisfied with it and destroys the iniquities that transferred down to us through our fathers, our grandfathers, our great-grandfather and our great-great-grandfather to the third and the fourth generation. This Italian scientist by the name of Camillo Golgi found that the Golgi apparatus can only hold proteins from your fathers up to three or four generations. Oh, I thought you'd get excited here, man. Even biologists are proving that the things that God has said is true. So Camillo Gale uh, Golgi, out of it, is a, he was an Italian scientist. He found that this compartment of the cell can only hold proteins from your forefathers, lipids and pro proteins from your forefathers to the third or fourth generation. Yes. Yes. Amen. The design of three and four generation was intentionally placed by God because of the failure of man to eradicate generational curses. Unfortunately, when the fourth generation comes, they begin to teach the fifth generation, who is supposed to be the first now generation, the same old tricks that they learn, and it transfers over now to the next one. So God had to do something. So he sent now his son, and his son had to actually die and shed this pure blood so that the sound in this blood will destroy the sound of your father's voice. So when Jesus, this is the Golgi apparatus here, the mitochondria comes from your mother. That's why when they study the mitochondria, they are finding out now that the oldest mother in the world is only 6,000 years old. With their new sophisticated machines. Oh, Jesus. When Jesus shed that blood in Gethsemane, that spot covered his face to protect your will. So you will always have control of your will. The next time you feel like you're losing your mind, apply the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of your mind. Say that with me. I apply the blood of Jesus 
over the doorposts of my mind. Say it again. I apply the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of my mind. Close your eyes now. I apply the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of my mind. And if the thought comes back again, what do you do? I apply the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of my mind. If it comes back again, what do you do? I apply the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of my mind. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have to remember there are two goats. One stays in the temple, sprinkled seven times over the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And then the other one, he's anointed with blood and he's sent out in the wilderness to die. But sometimes he doesn't die. He comes back in. So you might be free from something for 10 years and then suddenly something begins to happen. The goat returned. And you cannot kill that goat. The law states you cannot kill that goat. That goat has to die naturally. So the high priest used to study the wilderness and they used to take the goat to the place that they most likely can be eaten by lions. Oh Jesus. Are you with me so far? Today, I want to tell you, the high priest Jesus has already taught us where the wilderness, the best part of the wilderness is, where that goat can be eaten by a lion. It is called a dry place. You never bind and bound a devil and send them to hell. They cannot go there right now. The Bible says when the spirit comes out, it goes where? Into a dry place. That is their location. It is a dry place. It is a place of outer darkness. So you your words have to be right. You have to give that goat instruction. Tell that goat to go out into dry places. Now remember, sometimes from the dry places, what does he do? He's tormented there. He's there because you sent him there. But there comes a period of time when he leaves the dry place and he comes back in and he brings seven others with him. Why seven? The seven areas that Jesus shed his blood Amen. are all gates of your protection. Tonight, we are dealing with gate number one, and that is your mind. That is the way that you're thinking. Satan wants your mind, but God wants your mind too. He wants you to have the mind of Christ. Are you with me so far? So are you ready to break this? Are you ready to break it? Amen. I want you to stand to your feet. Those of you that have your oils, I want the elders of the church to come with me too as well. Father, we thank you. Jesus, I want the elders to stand on. as your one? Amen. Whose is this one? This is your one? You keep it right here. What I want you to do, we're going to... Oh, so, sorry, I am sorry. No, no oils yet. We are supposed to do the communion. Uh, if we could get the communion ready. Do we have the communion ready? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may have your seats just for a few seconds. Hallelujah. And oh, the blood of Jesus. And oh, the blood of Jesus and oh the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow Father we ask your blessings upon the bread and upon the wine symbolic O oh God of your blood Jesus and your flesh that was broken for us Father we ask right now that the anointing of the blood of Jesus will rest upon these elements tonight. That as we partake of it, O oh God, that you will send blood over our minds, over the dark posts of our minds, that our minds will be protected by the blood of Jesus. Lord, that the blood will cover, O oh God, tonight, our imagination, our thoughts, O oh God, the way that we think, O oh God, the blood of Jesus Christ will cover us. We ask, as we partake of this communion, that our eyes will be covered with the blood, our ears will be covered with the blood, that our nose will be covered with the blood, that our lips and our, our mouths will be covered in the blood, our cheeks will be covered in the blood, our head will be covered in the blood tonight as we partake of this communion tonight, O oh God. 
touch us tonight, we pray. Your blessings and your anointing upon the elements. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Tonight we invite you, whether you are part of this church or not, if you are a part or a member of the body of Christ, you can partake of this communion tonight. You don't have to be a member of this church. You just have to be a member of the body of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. The Bible tells us Jesus said to do this in remembrance of us. Remembrance of him. The reason why he says to do it in remembrance of him was because his body was dismembered. His, the joints were separated in his legs. His joints were separated in his hands. So he was dismembered. So when we remember, we bring the member of his body back together. Amen. So today you have in your hands the element, the physical symbol of remembering our Lord. His death, his burial, and his mighty resurrection. Jesus, we thank you. I know the blood of Jesus oh the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow Jesus we give you praise hallelujah 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 the blood and hallelujah and hallelujah it shall never suffer loss Jesus we give you praise we give you honor we give you glory oh Lord thank you Jesus thank you Lord we want to make sure that everyone is served if we missed you would you lift your hands wherever you are if we missed you out, amen. Jesus, we thank you. Hallelujah. That one is white as snow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Was everyone served? Did everyone get the elements tonight? Amen. You hold in your hands the symbol of the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Old Testament and the New Testament. But tonight we pray that this symbolism, as we partake tonight, will release the blood of Jesus Christ over our minds. It will release the blood of Jesus Christ over the doorposts of our minds. And once the blood of Jesus is there, if the dead angel comes, it has to pass over. So tonight, as we partake of this communion, that is exactly what's going to happen. Amen? I want you to get the bread out and lift it in your right hands at this particular time. Hallelujah. This bread is symbolic of the flesh of Jesus Christ. We are going to learn that in one place where he, his flesh was ripped into pieces for your healing. Because blood was released from that. We're going to learn about that very soon. Today you hold the symbolism of the bread. Which symbolizes the flesh of Jesus Christ. On the eve of his crucifixion, he met with his disciples. And after he had blessed it, he broke it. I want you to break it at this time. And he said, eat in remembrance of me. Let us eat together, remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus, we give you praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I want you to get the wine now ready. On that same night, when he sat with his disciples in the upper room, they drank wine, and the wine was for the establishment of the new covenant. Today, we are remembered of that new covenant. 
And that new covenant brings good and new things to us. He said, do this always in remembrance of me. Let us drink together of the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Then the Bible said they began to sing. They began to sing in preparation for another cup that's going to only be drunk in the kingdom of heaven, he says. And that is the cup of halal. Jesus, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Hallelujah. 